start? I'm afraid we're live. Well, let's hope you're live. <laughs> this is Jay Anderson interviewing Bob Pate, which is a change. Uh, Bob, uh, I'd like you to tell us something about yourself. First of all, you can go ahead and identify yourself and something about your background, about your parents, your grandparents, about where you were raised. Uh, anything you want to say about that, and then we'll get involved in other things. So I'll leave it to you there. You've done something. You know what happens on the case. Yeah, it, it seems kind of strange to be on this end of the camera uh, after all these people that have been so kind to talk to me. I know now how they feel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, my full name is Robert Lee Pate, better known as Bob. I was named after my grandfather. And uh, I was born December the 5th, 1928, in Yadkin County, southwest corner. Uh, my father was originally from South Carolina, William Preston Pate, and uh, he and my mother separated uh, two or three years after I was born, and he went back to South Carolina, and I never did know him. So my grandfather and my grandmother raised me and my mother moved back with them, and uh, I more or less was raised by my old people and by my mother there. Uh, I was born in the same house I live in now. I'm 57 years old now, and I think kind of strange it, in a way to some people that uh, you're still living in the same house you was born in, but that's the way the fate played with us. Uh, my grandfather was in the sawmill business back at that time. He was also a farmer and he was a major influence on my life and he let me tag behind him a lot and go to the woods and the wilderness and all this stuff, sawmill and so forth. But I guess this is the forerunner of how I would probably shape my life later. I attended school when I was five years old in a two-room schoolhouse called Shiloh Schoolhouse two teachers. And uh, I walked along with the rest of the kids because back then there weren't no buses. And uh, I undoubtedly finished the first grade because they let me go on to the second grade. One reason I think they said they let me go was because my birthday was in December and the school term, you know, was half over with and just let me go ahead and go with the kids. So undoubtedly I kept up. So my second year I went to a school called Windsor's Crossroads, and they had buses, so they, they bused uh, us kids and everything to Windsor's Crossroads uh, for the second grade. And at that time, West Jedkin School came into being, and that bus went on to West Jedkin to take the higher elementary and the high school kids. Before that time, all the kids that went on to high school had to go to Yadkinville or Union Grove. So uh, I came into my school years about the same time West Jedkin School came into being, and they're getting ready to celebrate their 50 years this year. Uh, finished there at Windsor's Crossroads, and then I went to West Jedkin and third grade on up through the seventh grade. I got a little lazy in the seventh grade and had to take it twice. The teacher went to my people, and he told them that he just thought, another year in the seventh grade would do me some good. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I knew that if I ever got rid of that man, I had to make honor row or pass or do something, so I, I got down to it at my second year in uh, <laughs> seventh grade. And, and they promoted me, and at that period of time, uh, the twelfth grade was added to the high school. You know, before, as you remember, there was only 11 grades around here in high school. So to, to uh, help make another class, they took a number of students and promoted them from the seventh to the ninth grade. And then helped make that eighth grade, they took other students that probably were not, their academics were not enough undoubtedly, or the passing grades were not enough to get them on in too. So I will happen to be into that ninth grade group. And uh, I, I finished high school at West Jedkin in 1946. I got lazy again in my 11th year. I don't know, it's just wild, I guess, so tell it like it is. That was during the Second World War years, and uh, when I went into the ninth grade, there were 44 of us students. And 
ironically, I was a historian back then, unbeknownst to what would happen to me later, but 44 of us entered the ninth grade. And in graduation ceremonies four years later, only 12 students graduated. That is a tremendous dropout. A lot of the kids wore farming, jobs, just went the way of the wind. A lot of them went on to higher learning. Not a whole lot <laughs> out of that 12, but what I'm saying, a lot of the students went on to <clears throat> other things. And I might bring in here that one of my close friends that was uh, a year behind me, he was in 11th grade while I was in the 12th grade, he and I run around a lot together, and he was from Hamptonville there, the village of Hamptonville. I live actually eight mile west of the village of Hamptonville. His name was Little Bill Wood. There were two Bill Woods in that area, Big Bill Wood and Little Bill Wood. Now, Big, Big Bill Wood went on, he's a judge in Western Salem right now. He did real well. He's doing real well. Little Bill uh, was Toastmaster at our graduation dinner at uh, Western Salem. He and I uh, took his dad's pickup, and we washed the cow manure out of it, and uh, we put our only suit on we had of his and, and drove it to Winston-Salem, and he was Toastmaster for the junior-senior banquet. Now I understand why a lot of the girls didn't date us. But <laughs> no, it, uh, Bill went on to State College, and he was an electrical engineer, and uh, he worked in that a while after he graduated and some of his professors came to him later and asked him would he like to become involved in a project that was just starting up. And he told me he walked the beach over there at Virginia Beach a lot trying to make up his mind and he finally decided to go with it. And that was the beginning of the space program, Wallops Island. And so he was in on the ground floor of that and he eventually went on and he was head of recovery of the Eastern Seaboard of this space program. Just to give you a little background on some of the people I've been fortunate enough to know and come up through with, and I think they really had an influence on me. I, uh, I was not college material. I tried it. I went to a business college in Winston-Salem, two or three months. Jay, I just couldn't hold it together. I, I didn't have good study habits. At the time, I didn't really know what I was doing, but I was just not college material. So I came back and uh, went to work. I got a chance to learn how to ride heavy equipment, and that was just coming into this country at that time, bulldozers, earth-moving equipment. And that paid pretty good because if you could get a job back then, a young boy would get a job, he, he was lucky to draw 50 cents an hour. Here I was up close to $2 an hour because I'd worked a year apprenticeship, greasers and all of this, muckers they call it, cleanup man, to be able to learn how to ride these big heavy machines and earth them. Now, I, I knew that I had a handicap in one sense of the word. When I was eight years old, I lost my eye with a slingshot. I did it myself, a little accident that happened. But when I lost that eye, I lost my depth perception, and I could not operate some of the big machines that required very close depth perception, because when you're coming around with a huge drag line bucket, you've got to be able to pick the hat off of a man's head and not bother the hair. I couldn't do that. I'd take his head, <laughs> and him too. <laughs> so they wouldn't let me run those kind of machines, <laughs> but that's understandable. I, I always left to fly. I, I, I spent the only $5 I ever had just to hire a man to take me up one time because I wanted to know what it was like from up there. And the other boys around there wouldn't ride. I was about 14, 15 years old. I'd worked my money out in the sawmill. But this is background. My people were good to me. I thought at the time they were killing me. My grandpa took me to the sawmills when I was 12 years old to drive teams in the summer months. He made sure I got my education in the winter, but in the summer. I went to the sawmills and I drove the teams. And as I got a little older, I moved on up into harder jobs at the sawmill, heavier lifting and things like this. They never would let me run the big saws because the sawdust on flying and I only had the one eye. And then after high school, working out into heavy equipment and everything, uh, I was about 19 and a half. 
and I met Doc Payton. Doc Wagner at that time. Dorothy Wagner. And uh, we dated for about a year and a half. And I think she uh, decided that she wanted to tie up the rest of her life with me. So uh, I was 21 when we got married, and she was 17. And we're getting ready to celebrate 36 years. So uh, I figure it was one of the most important things that ever happened to me because nobody can make it by themselves. And she's been the one to help hold me together. Now, at that time after we were married, right after we were married, there were no jobs in our area except priming tobacco or working at sawmills, and there were not that many. So I found out there was a job in Winston-Salem driving a truck. So all over, up and down the eastern seaboard. So we moved to Winston-Salem, little two-room cold water flat. And we had our children, she had our children real quickly. By the time she was 19 and a half, we'd done had our two babies. Our oldest is Patricia, and then Michael. Patricia is now married to Ronnie Evans. They have a son, Robbie, at 14 years old, and a daughter, Stacy, at 12. And that's our grandchildren. Michael married Helen Clark, and they live uh, there next to us, and they don't have any children. So we just have the two children and our in-laws and our son-in-laws and daughter-in-laws and our two grandchildren. So that's basically our family now. But after Winston-Salem, about three years of that, I got a chance to lease some property, farmland back in our area of Yadkin County, and we came back as a tenant farmer growing our water from a well, no bathroom, just an outside toilet. That's what we always knew anyway, because I was 19 years old before we ever got electricity in our house. And also, oh, oh gosh, it was on up. Uh, I was 30 years old before they ever got a, a bathroom inside the house. But that's, that's the way life was back yeah, there. And, uh, well, anyway, we farmed her right smart. Doc got her a job uh, at town, that helped out. And uh, we we made it. We never we were I guess married about mm, pretty near twelve years before we ever owned a car or pick up anything. We just did the best we could. We bought farming equipment first, and and uh, we just we we had to have that to make the money to put the food on the table and so forth. And anyway, coming on up the line. Uh, I went back the farming I couldn't handle it I was not being able to make enough I either had to get bigger or get out so I got a job in town and farmed along the side so I was doubling up what most guys were doing <laughs> at that time holding down two jobs and uh, then I went to work for back into the heavy equipment as a troubleshooter for a big company laying water mains and sewer mains sewer mains in Western Salem and around in the country, sometimes down in South Carolina. But from my past knowledge of heavy equipment and working in and around the big mains and things like this, I got a job as troubleshooter. And by this I had to test these big lines and we were very familiar with dynamite, high explosives, tunneling, mining, you could call it either way you wanted to do it. Sometimes we were living on the, the sharp edge or the fringe, out there on the edge. You had, you had to be right. You could not afford a mistake. And this helped us later in life, too, of what we were going to eventually become into. We could not allow ourselves to make a mistake of doing anything, because with dynamite, I mean, you just got one lick, and that's it. Bang, it's over with. In testing the big water mains, I would have to take them up to 200-pound pressure per square inch. And if you've got air trapped in a line somewhere, it's coming out of there. It's just like dynamite. And I've seen 12-inch water mains blow, blow clear out of the ground. It, it, a case of dynamite wouldn't have blown it anymore. Lift up huge backhoes that happened to be sitting there in that area. If somebody had been there, it would kill them. Fortunately, I, I've never been involved anywhere to where somebody lost their life. Now, people have gotten hurt. There's no question there, but nobody has lost their life, and we didn't. We strive for safety. We didn't allow ourselves to make a mistake. And this helped us 
with our inspectors. It took me six months with the big inspectors to gain their confidence that when they would ask me if valves were closed, I told them, yeah. They didn't go and check that valve to make sure it was closed, what I was testing again. They knew it was closed after six months of watching me. You try to build that confidence as part of, as part of living. Sure. So, I knew then, after three or four years of that work, that the jobs were going to start spreading out, which meant you had to travel. And I didn't want to travel. I didn't want to leave my family. Be gone. I had left them back in the first. Be gone 13 days. Never see my people. Two weeks. Three weeks. Never see my people. I didn't like that. And my children, at that time, I felt like needed me if they were ever going to need me. I needed to be a father figure because I had never had a father. I had a grandfather. And I made a vow that if I ever had children, they would know who their father was. And he would be there. So I gave up that job. I walked away from it. And uh, I guess then was a, a major turning point. I became self-employed. I started living on what I could earn by getting a job, going out here and do jobs that other people wouldn't know to do. And I got a chance to contract to Sears Roebuck to do their chain link fencing. And I contracted uh, for about seven or eight years to five stores in this area that left me at home at night. So we put food on the table that way. Now, in all my life, there was always something in the background. Uh, the river, water. I was fascinated with water. I was about 17 years old when I first saw the ocean. And man, I, I couldn't believe, but I never did go to Myrtle Beach or the commercial beaches. I was more interested in the des desolation, the, the beaches that were just totally out there by themselves. So when our kids come along, we started loading up the old station wagon and whatever we had, and we just go off to the beach and sleep in the back of the station wagon or out there on the beach. Our children grew up around the, the desolate beaches. They didn't know what Myrtle Beach was either because I didn't take them. <laughs> well, the reason I didn't have the money. Plus, I didn't want them to, they didn't need to know it. They'd learn that quick enough. I wanted to let them see the beaches like they were before commercialism got them. So, we, uh, our first boats, we're coming in and out of the rivers. Our first boats that I built to do what we call river running were out of gasoline, surplus gasoline tanks that I bought here in North Wilkesboro from Robbie. Robbie's surplus. $35. I bought a surplus gasoline tank that come off of a phantom jet. And my son and I took a hacksaw and we sought us out cockpits and put little pontoons on the side of this thing and boy you had to learn how to swim because that thing would roll like a barrel. You, you was upside down half the time. Well, Michael, our son, is a lot like I guess his daddy in a way. He, he is a free person. So it wasn't long until we had to have another boat because he wanted to go where I didn't, I wanted to go where he didn't, so there was conflict. So we got two of those boats, and we rode those for a while. Doc wasn't too interested in those boats. She'd done seen what they'd do, upside down, in the mud, all this stuff. We got a chance to go to Charleston, South Carolina, and buy a boat that was manufactured by a German, Jack Kissner, K-I-S-S-N-E-R, Kissner. Old German. He came here in the 30s, brought this idea, perfected it. This boat's been all over the world. Ocean going, whatever. It's a 17 foot kayak type boat out of canvas. We met him, became acquainted with him, and in one year's time, I had brought out 17 boats out of Charleston. Myself and my friends kept seeing these boats, say, hey, Bob, bring us a boat out. Well, to us, they were the kind of boat that we had to have to do what we wanted to do. We're cross-country riders. We're not the weekender or the person that just goes out here and lays on the riverbank and cooler. No, it's not. We cross-country. So, in his acquaintance and everything, he was involved in a lot of expeditions. And he had sponsored a Bulgarian to go into the jungles of Mexico and Guatemala. Now, I didn't know there were jungles in Mexico and Guatemala. I've read all my life, 
And I didn't know there were jungles there. I knew there were in South America, but not there. So he asked me, would Dot and I help support? Go support, which means back up. If he wanted to do one more big expedition, and he wanted to do it in this area because he'd never been there. So we did. We went in. He flew everything in. He could afford it. <laughs> Air freight, dollar a pound. <laughs> All that equipment, there was just four of us, no guides. We went back in there and the bush planes took us in, landed on runways, chopped out with machetes. Nobody had radios. We were totally isolated. The first time in my life I knew what total commitment was. The maps he had were wrong. He knew they were bad, but he didn't know how wrong. We, we lived, we came out, we survived. All four went in, all four came out. Dot and I became fascinated with that country and we went to National Geographic and we ended up in one of the assistant editor's offices looking for maps. That's what we went to National Geographic for, looked for maps. And this man ended up up there, he said, fellow, where you're going, there are no maps. Now this is in the mid-70s. And he says, it's the last unexplored left in Central and North America. I says, you mean to tell me National Geographic's got maps of the moon and all this other, and they have no map? He said, no. You live and come out, we won't see what you got. <laughs> so anyway, Dot and I, we couldn't afford the planes to fly all our equipment, so we looked around in a lot of school bus garages, and we finally found the thing we were looking for at the uh, Wilkes County school bus garage over here. It was a old bus, 58 Chevrolet. No, 59, I'm sorry, 59 Chevrolet. They'd phased it out. We bought it, $325. Back then, that, I mean, buses, you could buy them a dime a dozen, but this one we bought for $325. I gave uh, Mr. Green the seats. I told him I didn't want them, just strip them out. They stripped them out, brought the bus to us. We stripped it to the bare metal inside. Then we took the motor out, we took the transmission out, and the rear end out, and we sent these to people that we knew and had them rebuilt. Then I went inside and I started building. And we built what we call our expedition bus. We can sleep six people. Well, we have about everything that a Winnebago has, except a refrigerator. We painted the top white. We painted from the windows down blue. We were not going a flashy thing. The white was to get rid of the heat down in the tropics. So after we put this bus together, we did a trip. Five of us went back to that jungle. We could drive it right to the perimeter of the Bush Plain airports. That didn't cost us much. They could fly us in. We rode our rivers back there. We come back out. Five of us, each one of us laid down $300 a piece, $1,500 total in the kitty. We were gone a month, and we did that expedition on $1,500. But we were not the tourist trap. What I mean by that, our gasoline, our food, and our bush planes. That was, that was our expenses. We were our equipment we already had. So we did that one. Then we were involved. I might have to back up here a minute. We became involved on the New River fight to save the New River back in the late 60s and up in the 70s until it was finally signed to where nobody can dam it up. We were the people that rode the congressman when they came in out of Washington. And uh, when I say we, Dot and I and my other river people, we would uh, meet the congressman up on your river and we would ride him. And we were also doing photography work back then. We also did photography work in the jungle. Everywhere we go we were doing photography work. Nobody else seemed to be doing it. Then we started doing presentations in schools all over the country trying to save this river and we, we, we were some of the charter people that got in on the ground floor of the preservation of the New River. Well, <clears throat> after another expedition into Guatemala, our third one, in the late 70s, three of us went down. We were gone for two months all over Mexico in this bus, living with the people, back in the jungle, out in the Yucatan. <laughs> we did that one two months, three people for $2,000. The reason I'm saying this is, is not to be boastful. It's just to let people know you can do something without a big bankroll, but if you're mind to watch your pennies.
It's according to what you're going for. Our main thing that we spent money for was film. Our budget, our highest episode gasoline was our film. We all, uh, made sure that we had budget money for film. And, uh, and coming back out with all this footage, our friends in education down in our area wanted to see it, and then I ended up in a lot of schools doing presentations on Mexico because nobody had ever seen Mexico from this viewpoint. All they'd ever seen was Hollywood. So now we come into the early 80s. Uh, in the spring of uh, February of 82, Joe Matthews called me and wanted to know if I'd be interested in uh, doing a little river trip on the Yadkin. Now, Joe Matthews and I were involved on a new river fight, and he undoubtedly knew us enough because what he was coming up with was a trip down the Yadkin from the headwaters to the ocean. It had never been done. Let me interrupt just long enough for to ask that you go ahead and explain for the benefit of people 50 years from now who Joe Matthews was. Oh, okay. Joe Matthews is the uh, man that is uh, head of Piedmont Council of Government in Winston-Salem. He's rich. He's from East Bend, Yakin County. Uh, he wanted to know if we would consider doing a, a pretty good portion of the Yadkin. So when he and I finished talking, it was scheduled to do the whole thing, from the headwaters to the ocean, 450 miles. But we could only paddle 425 because there was not enough water in the upper reaches to float us. So he asked me to put together a schedule. He wanted me to put together a schedule of that river. He wanted, me, he wanted to know where I was every night, every day. He didn't want me to run over 20 miles a day. He wanted me at bridges or access points at night. We had to run a time schedule. In other words, uh, I couldn't run over the schedule. I could run right up to it. All right, he wanted to also know the day I was to leave Ferguson, which is west of the Wilkesboro's, or the Kerscott Reservoir, where we officially decided to launch from. And... Uh, he wanted to know the hour and the day I'd be at the 